I'm just going to talk briefly about Dragon Ball um, biomechanics, um, talk about the injuries that we see based on some of the research that's out there. There's not much research really for um, Dragon Ball racing, but for paddling in general, um, paddlers are prone to certain injuries, and I'll just mention those to you guys. Then we'll discuss injury prevention exercises. I can show you some of the exercises. I wanted to kind of see what who was here and to try to understand like the age differences because we can always come back. We can bring our therapist back and actually show you guys exercise or give you handouts based on your age because now I kind of get a better feel for it. It's, like, it's a pretty wide range actually, right? So different age groups are going to have different needs and so I can't really just give one set of exercises for everybody. I, I like to give exercises that are really going to be high yield and useful for you guys. It's easy for me just to give like a regular handout and call it a day, but I'd rather give you guys something that you can really use. And so today we're just going to kind of try to get a feel for um, uh, what your needs are, what your interest, uh, interests are in starting an injury prevention program. And then we can add to that, once you guys have that injury prevention baseline, then uh, I'm inside the foundation, then you actually can do performance exercise to really help you paddle better. Um, so now I have questions. So is there a coach here? Brian, here's a coach. Oh, great. Okay, how long have you guys been together as a group? About three years. Is that right? And what brought you guys together? Are you guys, do you just know each other from the community or is this a Kaiser team? It's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe for another little 10 second. Got it. And then how many competitions do you guys do per year? Three. Four. Four, okay. And then the season length is from when to when? February to September. So, we also paddle off season Oh, you do, okay. And then, um, Let's see, so then how many days a week do you guys practice on the water? Three, 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 three to four. Three to four, wow, no, okay. One, There's four three, opportunities and usually about three. Or three? Three would be the max for most people. How many boats do you guys run at one time? Uh, we can run two at one time. Two, and did, are your boats 20 paddlers? Not always. Not always, okay. Is that a requirement or no? You have to have minimum? eight. Require eight, that's it? Oh, okay. And how, what's the max in your boat? Um, 20. It'd be 20. 20, okay. And then um, you guys have a drummer in the front, and then you have a, um, you have somebody, you have a spotter at home, like in the back. Somebody steers. that steers. Steers, yeah, sorry, steer, right. <laughs> and so, um, then my other question was, how do you arrange your boat with the paddlers? Usually the larger folks in the middle, sort of like a bell-shaped curve. Got it. Do you put your, um, do you put your pacers in the front? Uh-huh. You do, okay. Okay, so it's pretty, pretty standard. Okay, great. Okay guys, so um, let's talk about paddling. <clears throat> so obviously you guys are here, it's a lot of different benefits uh, for dragon boat racing. It's great exercise, it's a total body workout. Um, it's, uh, you get the cardio aspect and there's a lot of strength, stamina, and endurance. So overall it's very healthy. It can be a very healthy exercise. Uh, you know, because it's a very social activity, there's a lot of good team building and that social aspect actually really rounds out the experience for dragon boat, or dragon boat racing. Being outside is also a great um, way to stay active and also be in a group setting. <clears throat> it really adds to the um, overall experience for exercise, right? Because you don't want to be cooped up in a gym all the time. It's nice to be outside. Um, in terms of uh, what I gather from my, ex my experience um, seeing dragon boat racing, you can really accommodate varying abilities in the same boat. That's why I was asking about how you arrange your boat. You can have different ages, you can have different abilities. Um, you can, everybody on the boat has sort of, you're doing something similar, right? Your boat is moving forward, but people in the boat have different roles, and so that's sort of interesting. So depending on your interests, you can decide what kind of um, Dragon Boat Racer you want to be. Um, and there's some universal applicability to uh, Dragon Boat Racing as well. I think it's a growing sport, it's really interesting. Um, in Hawaii we see a lot of uh, very traditional paddlers, and so we haven't seen that on the mainland over the years, and now I think with the Dragon Boat Racing um, increasing in popularity, it's uh, really kind of making it more universal. So, um, on the flip side, there are risks for dragon boat racing that I think are worth discussing. Um, there definitely is an injury p potential. You guys have seen that already for the years that you've been um, involved in dragon boat. It's a generally safe activity, I think, because it's, it, it is um, technically, it's a low impact activity. But what makes it risky are a couple of things, actually. 
it's a, uh, it's a rep highly repetitive activity. And then also, it's asymmetric. Are you guys switching sides on your board, or you just stay one one side? Do you guys switch sides. sides? Okay. So I think in some of the, you know, it, it depends. I think some people, some teams will stay on one side or the other. And then of course, I think that can be very risky. And so I, there's a way around that also, which I'll mention. But it's not as important for you guys since you are switching. Now, when you switch sides. Do you switch like let's say if you're on like on a given day, do you guys stick to the side that you're that you start like for the whole session? Switch halfway. You switch halfway. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. But, but not not everybody is switching now. So really? No. So some people are not switching. Yeah. Yeah. Was that? Do you lose more often than you go the other day? Well, okay, so that's a good question. So whatever, was that? <coughs> Yeah, so, I mean, technically, I think so. Um, you can ask Brian, he's a physical therapist. Um, he'll, what, what happens when you're doing an activity only on one side, you're gonna develop some uh, strength and flexibility issues that are one side or the other, but when you do it on both sides, it kind of balance out. So your strength can be, uh, so I guess the best way to explain it is that you know, you, you have to live also, right? You're not just dragon ball racing. So over the course of a day that you're working or doing other things, when your muscles get in, uh, in you, when you develop an imbalance, when you're dragon ball racing, it can impact the rest of your day and the rest of your livelihood. And so I think it's important always, I think health in musculoskeletal, um, uh, well, musculoskeletal health depends on symmetry of your body. When you're asymmetric, that's when stuff starts to happen. You get shoulder injuries, neck injuries. And so there's one, one component is the symmetry and the other component is the overuse part. And so when you switch side to side, then you're gonna actually balance out the stress to your body. So I do believe that uh, switching sides would be more beneficial. There's a performance aspect to the fact that some people will stay on one side or the other because they're either right hand dominant, left hand dominant, or they feel comfortable just paddling on the one side. So that's the one caveat, you know, depending on what your goals are for dragon boat racing. But I think for safety wise and for recreational dragon boat, I think it's better to switch sides. That's a long answer, but that's that's how I feel about it. So you guys individually should decide on how you feel comfortable. Um, it's always going to it's always going to initially feel more comfortable just to stick with one side that you you know because you get used to just yeah. paddling one side with your right or left handed, but uh, if, when you get over that then it won't make much of a difference actually. <clears throat> so one interesting um, point that I read that injuries occur mainly during practice, not as much during competition, um, and interestingly enough. Uh, women tend to get injured more in the water, and then men tend to get injured more doing out of water exercises. I'm not sure exactly why that is, but it's just some epidemi epidemiologic study um, that I read. <clears throat> so that's just a point of interest. So then you ask, well, why do injuries occur? We talked about the overuse, and uh, it's a it can be an overwhelming activity if you watch. Uh, if you know you're while you're doing it, you might not notice. But if you actually watch Dragon Ball Racers, if you see like you see videos on YouTube with a GoPro like facing the the paddlers, and it it looks really hard sometimes, right? And you guys won't notice because you're doing it. But when you see, you're like, wow, I'm doing that, and it's really kind of interesting to see. Um, there's an issue of duration, frequency, and intensity. Um, if you guys are just starting, you've never done it before, and you go out on a boat for an hour and a half, it's you know that's a long time actually. So um, it, because it's a team sport and a team event, when you're on the boat, it's not like you can say, okay guys, I think I'm just going to swim back to shore and jump out of the boat and go away. You're, you're stuck <laughs> on the boat for the whole time, right? So um, because it's a team activity, then you're sort of not it's not a peer pressure issue, but you know you're going to stay on the boat with everybody else, right? Um, so people will get fatigued variably on the boat. Some people very early, some people very late. And so when you start to fatigue and you're trying to keep up, and your form starts to break down, and that can be a problem. Or maybe your body wasn't really ready for the activity, and then um, you start to get tired, and you start using accessory muscles um, that you're not used to using, and then that's when things start to break down. It's always a really good idea to have a strong core even before you start your season. And we'll talk about that, because you guys are early on right now, right? So this is a good time, actually, to initiate our core program. So um, the type of injuries, who has been injured dragon boat racing? 
what were your injuries? I mean, what do you mean by injury? I mean, really, well, you really Well, okay. See a doctor. Let's say, okay, good question. So, what? who's had an injury that's kept you out of Dragon Ball Racing for some period of time? What, what was it? Lower back. Shoulder. Shoulder. Anybody else? Shoulder. Okay, so see, those are the, right? Those are the big ones. Lower back and shoulder. Yes? Shoulder. Yeah. Same, same idea. Um, and then who's had an injury that doesn't necessarily keep you from Dragon Ball, but it gets kind of aggravating because it bothers you. Maybe you have it for a week or two and it goes away or it just keeps coming and going. What, shoulder. Shoulder. Um, it was shoulder, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, back. Oh, back. Um, sometimes about one of my legs goes to sleep. It does? Yeah. Okay. Circulation. That's interesting. <laughs> it's not really an injury, I guess. But. It, it's not an injury, but it is a, it's an issue that's solvable, actually. Resolvable. Go ahead. Also the leg. It's kind of like... Numb. Falls asleep? Numb. Kind of a... a like, I think it's a nerve thing. Yeah, it is a nerve thing. You're, you're sitting right on your sciatic nerve. Yeah. On a hard surface. And so, yeah, that pushes on the nerve. Sometimes it's because of a tight muscle that actually contributes to that. But a lot of times it's just from even just sitting down for some people that come to it. Anybody else? Yeah. Neck. Ah, interesting. Okay. That's a good one that we didn't talk about. Anybody else? Yes? Back. Back, lower back. Yeah. Okay. So see, we've, had, we've had actually a couple of heart attacks. And, uh, <laughs> 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 I mean, we even had one death on our other team. You did? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we didn't talk about that part. Wow. Yeah. yeah, medical problems. So, yeah, so that, there's another medical component to it because it is a pretty stressful, it can be a stressful activity. So for anybody that has health problems, you should always check with your doctor and make sure that it's a safe activity because it's very vigorous activity. It's low impact, but it's really, um, a, it can be a very difficult cardiac activity. Yes, you have a question? I have two. Um, are there certain, like, if you have pre-existing injuries, so to speak, yeah. are there certain injuries that you should stay away from Dragon Boat? Do you know? Um, it's a good question. Yeah. So. Or you should just try it and see what happens. <laughs> for the for the big for the yeah, that's a really good question. I I'm, I'm here to be encouraging, so I'm going to say. That you <laughs> no, I just, yeah. Because I have people who want to join, but then they talk about. And yeah. I actually tried to get somebody to come. If you know, if somebody's had a knee operation, is like, should I tell them no? You shouldn't come here. Or I tried to get my husband to come here, and he's got a really bad ankle. And, he, you know, they make excuses, but you try to, you sure. want to be encouraging, but you don't want to encourage the wrong person to sure, join sure. if it just is totally not, but I do try to encourage. So I think shoulder and lower back could get worse with I Dragon agree. Ball Racing. Okay. So if you have those kind of issues and you're worried about it, then what you try to do is you try to see if you can correct as much of it as you can with a good <laughs> sports doctor and therapist a team of sports medicine doctors and therapists, um, and you, you do the best you can really that way. And then you kind of see how it goes. Just it's a different motion than maybe some of the other sports that you've done before, so it might not be as aggravating, but yeah, there's a potential if you already have an issue. I would say that if you have herniated disc in your back, then it would be extremely high risk, I'll talk about why. Um, so that would be one thing. If you've had shoulder surgery before, I, I wouldn't recommend to do dragon ball racing either. I think it's going to put you at a lot of risk. But you can get cleared. I mean, if you see someone like Brian and, you know, your shoulder, let's say you don't have injuries, but you have a past injury and you're worried that's going to come back. I mean, if your shoulder looks strong, your core looks strong, then you might as well give it a try. But you should see somebody to make an assessment. And a sports doctor or a physical therapist can help you with that. Um, Okay, so the, the one thing is that there's more overuse injuries and acute strains, but that can happen too. So during a competition, maybe when you're really trying hard, or I guess even at the end of a practice when you start to fatigue, you can all of a sudden strain a muscle and that'll just go away in a week or two. But the overuse injuries are the ones that we really try to prevent, because that's when damage starts to build up in your body, and you don't want that. <clears throat> so for who's new to Dragon Ball this year? Okay. <clears throat> So, um, are you guys getting scared now, or are you guys okay? That's scary away. After that, okay. So, um, the way to avoid overuse is to make sure you structure your season for a gradual introduction to the activity. Because you can't just get on a boat with people that have been paddling for two, three years already. You have to build up to it. 
And so um, some of that, a lot of that's going to occur either in preseason or at the beginning of the season. I guess you guys have a way to, to get people involved, is that right? Like you have some sort of introductory program. Um, some of it would require some uh, general out of water paddle technique and then just a gradual um, increase in activity. It's the cadence actually I think that um, that can throw people off a lot because uh, when you're on a boat and somebody you, you have certain strokes per minute and then you're not used to that, then that's actually a really quick way for somebody that's a beginner to get injured. And so developing that sort of rhythm and cadence that, that's, uh, that sort of represents what the boat's going to um, row at is something that you should do right off, that you should learn right off the bat. And that's where people have a limitation, I think. So cadence means like strokes per minute or when you're running steps per minute. Um, also, you want to definitely get your conditioning going. Like, you want to have some cardio base um, to begin with. And if you don't, you can develop it over the first few months. It just that tells you how fast you can jump into your um, <coughs> dragon boat season. If you're not really, if you haven't been doing a lot and you're just starting your dragon boat um, racing for your exercise because you haven't been exercising a lot, then you really take it slow. If you've done some cardio, then of course it's, it's a lot um, easier to get into it. Um, you guys are pretty, it's pretty appropriate. Three days a week is good, actually. In, generally in sports, three days a week is the, probably the lowest injury risk when you get the... So the, the core, and what I'm going to talk about now, is, um, or what I'll talk about in a few minutes, the core is like basically from here to here. And so this is your stable base. And so the better you are from here to here, the better your arms can move and the better your legs can stabilize your body. And so that's why core actually helps against overuse. Because you might think, well, if I'm strong here, what does that have to do with this? But whenever you're strong here, it makes, every, it makes your limbs more efficient. So Dragon Ball mechanics, um, you guys are probably pretty familiar with that. Do you guys talk about that at all? You talk about the setup and the catch and everything. So each, each phase of the, of the Dragon Ball um, stroke or the paddling stroke has its own sort of risks and issues. Um, when you're on your setup and you have that A-frame, you guys are familiar with A-frame, right? Yeah. Um, so that A-frame actually, if you have a, if your paddle is not, if you're holding your paddle too high, or if you don't have the right size paddle, then that actually can put your shoulder way out of position. And so it can actually, if you watch some people on, um, if you watch people on the water, sometimes their shoulder's going behind their head, and so those are things that can cause injury. Um, in that position itself actually puts your shoulder in, in impingement actually. So what that does, it pinches or rotator cuff muscles. Um, so that if you're leaning too far forward, then it actually puts pressure on your rotator cuff muscles and actually your shoulder blade has to be strong. And I'll talk about that. Um, in the setup, you're starting to actually also twist your trunk from neutral. And so it's coming out of position for someone who just does normal activities that don't require a lot of trunk twisting. Um, and then the neck position. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm just going to have you stand here because oh. I think the TV is blocking a lot of people. It is. Oh, got it. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> so, so, um, the, uh, the other thing that happens is your neck position sometimes. When you're, too, when you're really busy paddling, you don't really pay attention where your neck is, so sometimes your neck will turn, come down. So for some people, it hyperextend, but most of the time, it's, they're, they start looking down. So that's something that you might want to sort of pay attention to see. Um, and so excessive reach, neck position, and then, of course, paddle height for the setup. Um, when you catch, actually, now you're starting to get towards your power stroke. That's going to, this is getting to be the most vulnerable uh, position. Again, impingement because your shoulder comes, anytime your shoulder is here or here, you're at risk for injury. So here's a, is a good one um, for uh, getting injured. And so now also what you're doing now, when, when you're in that twist position, you're starting to flex your trunk. That puts a lot of stress on the lower back so that if somebody is there, that tends to hunch over because you don't have good posture to begin with, or if you're trying to compensate because you're tight maybe down here, then you hyperextend your back when you're going into that motion. Those are all going to be increasing your risk for injury. You want your spine to be very neutral. And so either hyperextending or actually hunching over is going to put um, a lot of stress on the back. So hunching over is bad for the discs in your back that pinch the nerves. And then hyperextending actually puts a lot of stress on the bones themselves. 
and uh, can cause problems later in life. Um, you also have to have good trunk flexibility because of the fact that you're going to be leaning forward. And some, a lot of us, especially if we sit at a desk, we get really tight back here. And then what happens is you end up having to compensate by moving your shoulder forward. And that makes you overreach for your shoulder. So the uh, spine flexibility is very, or trunk flexibility is very important. <clears throat> um, and when you're pulling now, that's when you're really going to be using your rotator cuff at its max. So you get the max stress on the rotator cuff muscles. Now you're having to actually um, extend your spine, and it, it's all supposed to be a coordinated movement. But for uh, for you know, for a lot of us. It takes some technique, it takes some time to learn actually how to get that real fluid movement. And in the meantime, if you have some weaknesses and strengths, uh, if you have some weaknesses or some uh, imbalances in your body, you start overusing one or the other. Either you try to compensate with your spine, compensate with your shoulder. Somebody said something about their biceps. It may be that you're actually pulling a little bit and you're bending at the, at the elbow actually, and that's a technique <coughs> error. Um, so you try to sort those things out actually. So in the pull, your arm, your arm can flex, which it shouldn't, because it's putting too much pressure on your arm. Um, the uh, spine can either bend or, or the, actually at this stage, your spine would extend or hyperextend, which would be um, bad. Um, or if you're trying to pull with a flexed spine, also can be bad as well. So you want your spine to be neutral. And then the paddle position also and paddle movement is sort of important, but that's another. That's more for something that Brian could teach you. Um, exit recovery. You know, that's the end of the motion. You have to, again, be flexible. Um, in general, for all of these phases, there's an activation sequence in your body, and that's where your core comes in. You want your core to engage before anything moves, because when your core is stable, that's when everything else actually works well. But if your core is doing all this, then your arms can't really um, manage that very well. And that's, you get these micro -compens compensatory movements, and that actually causes a lot of injuries. So, one interesting thing is that um, I develop a lot of performance programs for different sports. And so, when I was kind of reviewing a little bit about Dragon Boat, I've never had a, a checklist for Dragon Boat for video. But you can actually videotape yourselves and figure out what your biomechanical issues are. And that's something that maybe we can look into at some point. But I do have a checklist, and I just talk about. Did somebody, was somebody raising their hand? Okay. Um, generally, paddle length, neck position, um, how much your trunk is twisting, are you flexible, inflexible, or are you moving too much, um, how is your spine aligned, and where is your shoulder position, all those things you can look at video. And so if you're wondering about, let's say, your biceps, am I bending my arm too much, the, the best way to see it, because it's hard for you to tell, right, when you're doing it, but you have to either have somebody watch you do it, and video is actually the best, because you can slow it down, you can review it. And so, video, at some point, you guys should look into trying to videotape yourselves, either from a GoPro on the boat, or from someone on another boat, um, at some point in your season, because it can give you a lot of information. <coughs> okay, so, um, you have the right coach, because he's going to really be good at teaching you guys about how to warm up. You know, you say, well, how do I stretch? Do I stretch and hold? So I, I bend over, touch my toes, hold it for 20 seconds, or do I stretch while I'm moving? Generally, it's better to stretch while you're moving. Um, it prevents the strains. It gets your body ready for exercise. Over time, it probably does prevent from overuse. So like, warming up well will prevent injuries. On the other hand, if you don't warm up, you're really putting your body at risk for injuries. When you come to practice, it's early in the morning. Your muscles are tight, it might be cold outside, you really need some time to get the, the blood moving, warm up the muscles, make them a little more compliant and flexible, and then you're ready to, to um, paddle. So, of course, Brian will take you through a program to get you sort of ready, kind of call, you can call your body out and get it ready for, um, uh, for paddling. One example, actually, I don't know what you guys do, you have some sort of dynamic warm up, right? If I'm I were looking at the list, and I think we do quite a bit of this. Okay, fine. So if I were going to do like a two-minute dynamic warm-up, I would, you know, I do some trunk rotations, up, down, left, and right, arm circles. You can do um, arm forward raises, um, trunk twists where you're twisting back and forth, um, like a arm side bend where you're really getting a stretch down here, and you can do it to the side and to the front, and you do repeats that way. Um, uh, Oh yeah, calf raises, we walk and you walk on your toes, walk on your heels, 
Um, there's a split squat, which I'll show you guys later, where you just do this and maybe twist your body over to the side and just do this repeated, and then you just keep your, um, your spine upright, twist, and back up. And then uh, cross body stretch for the arm is actually really good for the rotator cuff. So that would be, that would be the one stretch that you, you would hold, actually. Do it light and do it a little bit more, um, a more of a stretch, like 10 seconds at a time, maybe two or three times. Okay, so the core we talked about briefly, it, it's not just your abs. Most people think the, the core is just your abs, but it's actually your abs, your trunk, your hips, and then the small muscles in your spine. And these all have to be very steady to hold your body stationary from here so that you can move your arms and your legs freely. Now, it's interesting about Dragon Boat. A lot of sports that I counsel for, we either work down here or we work up here. But for Dragon Boat, you have to do really both. So your, your core for Dragon Boat also actually will um, take it, has to take into account your shoulder blades. So the way that I recommend injury prevention exercise, you do at least two to three times a week. Um, start simple, really basic. Our, some of our athletes that come in to, for physical therapy, if you don't explain that to them, they think, well, these exercises are way too easy. I go to the gym, I lift like a thousand pounds, and then you're telling me just to do this like five times? That's not anything I think for my uh, strength. But that's really all it takes because you're activating not the gym muscles, but the behind the scenes muscles that actually don't get any work otherwise. They're the ones that are holding everything together while your arms and legs are moving. And so while you're trying to build you know, your pecs and your um, shoulder muscles, these little muscles inside are just kind of holding on for dear life. You have to train those muscles to actually function. Not only that, but they have to activate so that before you do this, the rotator cuff muscles are already tightening up and holding everything together. Otherwise, the shoulder goes all over the place when these big muscles pull everything out of position. <coughs> and we can, like I have injury prevention exercises that are super basic and that are super difficult. They get all the way to a very advanced and elite level. <clears throat> so for the upper core, your, your shoulder stability actually starts, can you, is there, can you see this angle? Is it there? Oh, okay. So the shoulder is a ball and socket joint. And it's well, I should this here. The shoulder is a ball and socket joint. That's this. That's where you're moving your arm, right? And so the stability of the shoulder actually starts from here, which is your shoulder blade. And so the shoulder blade is right back here. So that's everything gets held in place from the shoulder blade so that your arm can move freely. If the shoulder blade has too much motion or if it's tilted in a funny way, then the arm becomes very unstable. And so the exercises that we focus on the upper body for the, for the core, for Dragon Boat, focus on shoulder blade or scapular stability, because that bone is called a scapula. That's what your shoulder blade is. So that's the one stretch that I mentioned, the rotator cuff stretch. And this actually is a good stretch because people get tight. So it's part of the reason why I put it in as a... Um, core exercise is because physiologically over time our rotator cuffs get pretty stiff in the back and so what we do is we want to make sure that we have a good stretched out posterior shoulder rotator cuff and so that's one that you just stretch and hold. So that's an example, these are just examples of a program and sort of the principles of what would make up a program. So for the shoulder blade actually, actually no, this will be easier. So the shoulder blade, it's difficult to actually exercise the shoulder blade unless you think about it. So the way that you, that you um, for the most part, the way that you strengthen your shoulder blade is by pinching backwards. And so this exercise on its own seems like nothing, but when you actually pinch the shoulder blade back and then do the activity, it's a lot harder. It's a lot more deliberate, and you're actually hitting the right muscle. So this is an example of a scapular shoulder blade exercise. I just call it sunrise. Um, another exercise would be what we call like an F-16, like an airplane, where you start here and then put your shoulder blades back. So see, if I'm like this, right, because I have a tendency to slouch forward. If I'm like this and I do this, I'm, not, I'm really just working my tricep and upper arm. But now if you see I do it like this, my shoulder's in better position, and then I actually come back, and it's a lot different because I'm now working my 
back, which is the, the shoulder blade. <coughs> and so the shoulder blade muscle attaches to the back. And so you take your shoulder, squeeze back, and then bring it down, palms back, and that's another one. You do repeats like that, five to ten of those, just like you would for the, the sunrise. <coughs> so that's, a, ex that's an example of a very basic and simple way to start to activate your core in the shoulder in your upper body. Now, in the lower body, like I mentioned, you have your trunk, your spine, your, um, your hips, and so there's a lot to work on. But we can consolidate those into some simple muscles. Again, for stretching, actually, I talked to you briefly about this part here is very important for your dragon boat. The quadratus lumborum and your trunk muscles have to be um, really flexible. And so you can do, you can actually even get some, your um, hamstring stretch out with the first uh, stretch, but it's mainly for the lower spine where it attaches to your pelvis, where you bring your arm up, bring it across your body. You can do it standing, sitting, or you can do it like that in a wide position so that you actually also stretch out your hamstrings. And then a trunk twist actually, so you bring your legs to one side and then twist your trunk to the other side is another way to, uh, uh, to stretch those out. And again, the reason why the stretch comes into play for the core stability is because these muscles get tight and dysfunctional. So you want that part to be flexible for your core. Now, to stabilize the core, what you do actually is you're starting to work on your trunk, and then you also want to work on the back and your hips. Your hamstrings are part of your hips, your glutes are part of your hips. So glutes and hamstrings actually, what you do is you do a bridge. Have you guys done this exercise before? This is a great exercise actually. It really hits a lot of parts of your lower core and into your legs and it coordinates the two, which is a, it's one of my favorite exercises for all sports. And so the way you do it is to hold it for only a, maybe two or three seconds and do repeats. Once you get good at it, you hold it for up to 30 to 60 seconds. Once you get good at that, then you can do it on one leg with one leg out. And so um, this is a great, bridge progression is a great way to stabilize your core. If you're only gonna do one lower um, lower core exercise, I would do bridge. The other key to that one is that you want to keep your spine straight. The errors that I see that people do when I assess somebody's core is that either they sag here or they hyperextend. <clears throat> Another good core exercise to get the trunk uh, stable and then also coordinate with your upper and lower body is called a dead bug. And so the way I like to do the dead bug is um, arms in the air like when a bug is upside down and then you can start by just moving um, one arm back one leg forward or when you get good at it then you move one arm back and then the opposite leg forward and so you coordinate that way it works your abs it works your trunk um, and then it coordinates with your uh, arms and legs the split squat was the one I mentioned as a um, as a warm-up exercise so this would be a very basic core, introductory core exercise for your lower body. Actually works the hips really well. And so all you're doing is actually you're one foot in front of the other and then you just drop and then come back up. And then you just stay upright. And you do repeats like that. Now, with Dragon Boat, you're twisting your trunk back and forth. I think that's a really um, big uh, source of injury. So you want to start training your body to actually be very stable while twisting your trunk. So now you've, what you've done in the previous exercises is that you start to activate these muscles here. Now you want to actually test them to make sure they stay strong while you're moving. So you can take a, like a really light ball, hold it in front of you, and then twist your trunk back and forth. And you're going away from neutral, back to neutral, away from neutral, back to neutral. When you get to the point where you get pretty strong, then you can actually add to those simple exercises, make them a little more complicated, a little bit more of a challenge, and they become a little more practical and useful towards your dragon boat. So this is an example where you take, let's see, I'll do this one actually. So we're kind of adding to what we already did to make it more complicated um, or more useful. And so now you do a side lunge with the ball, and then you turn and twist your body, turn it out, back, and then back to the beginning. And you see how that's a little more complicated mo motion and movement because you're building on what you've already developed before. So like let's say four to six weeks after you do those simple exercises within a season, then you start to do these. 
And then what that also does, it corresponds with you're improving your technique and form in the water, and then you get stronger and stronger proportionally as your season goes along. Um, another one would be the split squat with the twist. So the side lunge, we're actually moving back and forth. The split squat would be you just stay in this position, but now you're coming down. Remember what you were doing before, and now you just twist. You can hold a ball or just do it without a ball. Now, I did point out to you guys in the, um, in the motion, um, in the pull, you're actually having to extend your spine. You want that to be a very stable motion for your back. You don't want to hyperextend or overuse your, the, the muscles in your back because that's how you get injured. Um, the quadruped is a good exercise for strengthening. Again, you get into this position, which can be a challenge as we get older. We get stiffness here, we get stiffness down here, but even to get in that position is a good start because we're not even used to actually being in that kind of position other than when we were kids. And then um, when you do the exercise after that, like once you get used to being flexible, you bring your one arm up in front of you, opposite leg behind you. Either you do one at a time, just do the arm up and down, then the leg up and down, and then you do both arm and leg up and down. It's a very challenging exercise. I would correct her form. Yeah, but I, yeah, also, we, we talked about that. Her back's a little hyperextended, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, if you weren't here, I could have gotten away with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's okay. Um, but you get the basic idea, right? Yeah, so, so that's our quadruped. Um, some more advanced exercises that, again, you start to actually incorporate some functional movement with the core activity. So let's say you take, I use a rope for this one, but you get a paddle implement. So let's say you're going to start doing gym exercise. You really want to take it up to, to a higher level like what Brian had mentioned. And you want to do exercises that are going to really directly impact your strength and your um, speed, cadence, everything in the water. Then you just have to start doing some gym type exercises where you have to do a little bit more of a challenge. And so what you do is you hold, like you, this is against the, you can see the cable I guess, right? Um, you go to the gym, go to the cable machine, get either a rope that you can hold straight or a, um, a bar, and then you hold it at one end, and then this one is going to be actually, so you're out of the neutral plane and then coming back to neutral. And so you're twisting your trunk from the start, you're pulling the weight here and then bringing it back. And so that's one example. So it's a trunk twist kind of paddle. A little bit more functional would be bringing it down like that. Sort of, sort of similar to an A-frame, so you can actually, um, unfortunately with the rope we were a little limited, but with the bar it's actually a lot easier. So you can actually bring it to the side, or you can bring it from the top and bring it down. So those are really good um, core exercises that actually also will test your strength. <clears throat> because at this point now, you've already strengthened this part. And so now you're actually using it, you're using this strength to actually work towards your form and technique for more practical movement for the paddling. So um, if you were going to do a performance program now, you've already activated and engaged your core, and now you're really working towards the trunk twisting, um, making sure that when you're pulling that your back is in good alignment, but then you're doing exercises that make you even stronger. And some of them you can do that, that gym strength program like I just mentioned. The ideal schedule, I think, would be definitely before you exercise, always do your dynamic warm-up to get the muscles ready. That's going to be one really key way to prevent injury, even if your core is not that strong. But um, in your dragon boat racing or dragon boat practice, you want to really emphasize your form and technique. Take it slow, especially if you're new. Refine, because your form and technique are going to be a big part of how healthy you can keep your body because all that compensation actually, all those extra movements are not good. You get used to sometimes just doing things the way you like to do them because you feel like it's efficient, but you really have to try and see if you can perfect your form over time. And like I said, the video actually is good for, for being able to tell exactly what you're doing. Sometimes it's eye-opening, you just never realize you did this or that, or you know, especially for like neck position, hyperextension. Um, and you want to slowly develop your endurance and stamina over the course of a season. You just, you don't need to rush into it, it takes time. Like Shirley said, your season is a, it's a long season actually, right? so it's very good. Um, the core exercise you should do at a minimum of two times a week on your own. Um, it's a good idea to do the core exercise apart from when you're doing your dragon boat when you're first starting. 
but then actually when you're really advanced, you can do your core exercises in the middle of practice, before practice, or after practice, or apart from practice, um, because that really actually um, gives you different ways to get stronger. And then strength performance, one to two times a week, maybe once a week, maybe twice a week, depending. Um, I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned too much about triceps, but there are specific muscles that you can, you know, your gym muscles that actually will, will um, when you strengthen, will benefit you for your dragon ball. But that's kind of something that I don't think that recreational uh, paddlers should worry about so much. But if you're really looking for an edge, you've done all your other background, homework, and basic foundation, then of course you can take it to another level that way. And so, if you guys are interested, what we can do is, um, we can kind of create some programs for the kids and for the adults. We can start with a basic program and that can, um, you know, if you, if you like the program, then we can actually give you a more advanced program later or maybe we can give you some tiers of, um, of uh, different levels. I think everybody probably should start at a basic level. It may only take you a week to, to figure out that you're strong enough, but for some people, they really need to work on it for three to six weeks. Yes? Uh, so far you have not talked about the uh, positioning of our legs. And yeah. how we can toe to either extend both legs forward or mm -hmm. one, one forward, one back. Any difference? Well, any recommendation? It's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough question actually. I think there's something to be said about both methods. Um, for some people, they're not going to be able to tolerate the split, that split stance. Right. And so it, it tends to put a lot of pressure on the outer knee against the boat. And so I think that you, you should go with what's comfortable, honestly. It can, you can, there are pluses and minuses to both. I don't know about performance-wise. Do you know, Brian, about which is better? Well, I thought but, the split is better. Yeah, what I've said is that you know, while we're racing, I do want the uh, outside leg forward, and I yeah. want you to use your hip and, and push that against the gunnel. It takes a lot of hip strength. I think over time, if you, if you do that consistently during practice and everything, you will feel it in your knee and your hip and potentially an ankle if somebody has an ankle injury. Um, and I say, you know, when we're practicing, it's not a big deal. You can have both legs forward, both legs back, or, or you know, the, even the inside leg forward, just to switch it up a little bit to prevent some injuries. And, um, you know, referring to, you know, how we're twisting in the boat also, it's worth noting that the lumbar spine, the lower part of your spine, actually doesn't twist very much. You get a lot of rotation from your hips, a lot of rotation from your upper back, but that, uh, you really need to stay strong and centered so that you don't over rotate that lumbar spine because that's going to cause a lot of injuries. We have a lot of those injuries anyway, just uh, through time. Um, and you know, Dr. Kapoor is talking about uh, trying to get a program together to get you guys to exercise. Unfortunately, some folks didn't exercise so much during uh, the off season, but now's the time to kind of get any kind of movement going. And also, you know, in spite of having an exercise program. You guys can really mess yourselves up at work or just in daily life with your electronic devices. Your posture is, is hugely, hugely important because you can do those exercises and you'll still have some problems if you don't clean up the postures and things like that in the off time when we're not sitting on the boat. Yeah, that's exactly right. So the spine, I guess one point that Brian's making that I should emphasize that when your spine is really stable, that's when you actually get less movement that's dangerous to your lower back. And that's where the, the back injuries are coming from, is too much motion because your, your trunk and the small muscles are supposed to be stabilizing the lower spine are not working, they're not engaged. And that's what you're really working on with the core. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, you didn't really talk about any leg strengthening. Is that just natural running? I think with, and yeah, I think you don't with, really have to do any concentrated things for the legs? Or? I, I start with the core for injury prevention. I think that you'll get a lot of it on the water and, and with your training um, because it's a very particular type of exor activity exercise. We do actually add on, which I didn't put in, um, the glute medius actually for strength as well, um, for uh, an exercise progression for the core. And then the hamstrings, of course, you're going to get with the bridge. I think those are good. I think most people have overdeveloped quads, so they don't have to worry about it. They'll develop their quad strength in relation to their, to their um, dragon boat paddling on the water, so it's not as much of a concern, but it's the glutes and the hamstrings actually that would need work, and I tried to put the most high yield exercise for that, which would be the bridge. And I think it's sufficient for most people on a recreational level. Recreational to competitive, yeah.
I think if you want to modify the bridge, you can always put some uh, resistive bands around your knees and then push out as you're uh, bridging. And then it's going to get some of the uh, outside hip muscles. Trying to put your leg out is enough right now. That's probably my the, son is yeah, like throwing his leg out. I'm like, I can't do that. Yeah. So I can see that, you know, just Oh, well, it. with the two legs, you know, you can push up with two legs and then just have something here holding your knees together and pushing against that at the same time. But both feet are still on the floor. Okay. Yeah, there's a whole ton of different bridge exercises. Yeah. Yeah, it starts really simple. And uh, you can advance later, of course, anytime. So yeah, Dr. Kapoor is just trying to present, you know, what's the most basic form of these exercises. And, and for every exercise, there's an infinite number of variations that, that you can try or think about yourself or ask somebody. Anybody else have any questions? I'm sure you guys want to get out of the water, right? Oh, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I have one more. So just, I, I'm really worried because my son does high school dragon boat and they are exclusively one side. So of course I wanted him to come. He's like, no, I don't need to come, you know. Right. But I just really worry about when they okay. train the kid, the young kids at one side. And you know, everything they do in sports for kids is so, they just overdo it for the kids these days. Every sport is overdone, pitching, yeah. everything. So, so, so that's one thing that I didn't mention, and I'm glad you brought it up, because the way to actually overcome that asymmetry issue is to do some sort of either a light gym workout or <laughs> yoga or something else that balances your body. When you do that, you have to actually do that kind of an activity two, three times a week, very consistently. And it'll help to minimize the asymmetry, honestly. But it, you do, you know, like when you're lifting weights, like for someone his age, if you're lifting and you're doing biceps, triceps and everything, those are the ways that you can actually keep your body relatively symmetric in strength. And something like yoga, which depends, you know, again, on your body balance, um, those are good activities to actually minimize the long-term damage from an asymmetric movement, like staying exclusively on one side of the boat. Yes? Yeah. And my second question is how um, my daughter is volleyball and basketball and I want to see if I can make a point to see if you can see the curl thing in oh. the area or no you don't actually. Um, so you can contact me by KP Sports at KP. Is everybody Kaiser here? No, right? No. Oh, okay. Well, so she's Kaiser. She is. Okay, I, 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 yeah. yeah, so I'm, I can be reached at KP Sports at KP.org, or you can just come and talk to me afterwards, and we can just, we can, we'll call you and we can take care of that. We have injury prevention programs for kids. Um, a lot, lots of people will come and see me to just get an assessment, and we do some core evaluation. I work with my team of therapists, and we coordinate a program. And so if you guys are interested in, in a totally individualized PT program, then of course you come see me or see one of our therapists and we put you in a really good program that takes you know three months to actually master, but it's really worthwhile for someone who's serious about um, their sports and just in being gener generally healthy. And so um, that's one way that we can do it too. We can, we can personalize our activities. But I can give you guys general handouts too, and I, I think we can start that way, something basic. Yes? Yeah. Appreciate your time. Sure. Time. Oh, okay, no problem. Yeah. When I grow up, I'm going to be like this. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? No, I'm going to say I, I really have a great appreciation for Edgeport awesome. coming out because, uh, you know, I've worked with some sports med docs in San Francisco as a physical therapist, and uh, he's in the best shape of any doctor that I know. And so I think that's, that's really valuable is that, um, you know, you're your best uh, experiment, right? You know, you yeah. work through your own injuries and figured all those things out and, and just, um, I think it's really important for everybody to think about maintaining a higher fitness baseline so that when we do have to compete, it's not so, uh, so much of a chore to get to that next level. Wow, thank you so much. Oh, you have a question? No, I want oh. to send you. Oh, so kind of. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, if you get, if you actually have pain against the side of the boat, then you can get a volleyball knee pad, and that might help actually. Um, that's one way, but the stress on the knees is a difficult one to overcome. So that's when, like, when Brian was saying, you change and shift your position so you're not always in one position. That will be key for you. You might find that you don't like your knees to be in flexion, 
all the time, so you want to actually split back and forth. If you you definitely be someone that should switch from side to side of the boat, so that you're, if you're going to do a split stance, that one leg is in front one time and one leg is in front, so you balance it all out. And so I would say that definitely switch your positions. If you have a sports doctor or therapist, it's a good idea to get, if you have arthritis in your knees, or if you have arthritis anywhere, you should always, and you're very active, you should always go and see a professional to get some uh, joint protection exercise program to supplement your activity. And so you might benefit from something like some quad strengthening, balancing your quads and your hamstrings. And those are simple exercises that you can do, that yeah, you can learn. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any more questions? Alright, thank you so much. We want to present you oh, um, our team t shirt. That's pretty awesome. <laughs>